Uh, now later, some of the Germans realized that, hey, this was a big waste, because as the Germans began to run out of manpower to run their factories, they said, hey, these 15, there were 6 million Jews, at least 9 million people, these 15 million people we killed, we could have just fed them a little bit and put them to work as slaves, and they could have manned our factories. As it was, the Germans were running out of factory workers, so therefore they were running out of everything they needed for the war. It takes about 150 factory workers to keep one soldier going on the front lines. And one of Hitler's high up men wound up admitting all this was one big sad waste. Um, they asked Hitler late in his life, short before he committed suicide, if he had one regret, he said, yes, I have one regret. My regret is there were still some Jews left in Britain. This is known to him, and uh, he, his last words were something about uh, telling his people, continue the fight against Jews and against their existence. Um, You know, that's the obvious question. I'm glad you asked it. All right, the standard view that you'll find is that it had to do with race, a feeling that we are racially superior, and a feeling that we must have it. We're better than other people. I mean, every human has it, if you admit it. They were better than other people, and therefore it's our duty to prove our betterness. And also that Hitler was trying to make up for his own feeling of inferiority by trying to show he was boss. That is one answer that's given. There is another answer, folks, that I will give, even though I'm hesitant to say it in the state school, but it's the answer that I'd give if I were asked this in a Sunday school class. The war was against God. Whether or not God exists, that's a matter for each of us to decide individually. I mean, there, over the weekend, there was a new movie, movie came out, God's Not Dead. I don't know how many of y'all happened to see it, but a uh, new movie came out. The war, though, was against God. And a lot of people have spent their lives fighting against God, whether or not he exists or not. I mean, why fight against someone who you are strongly convinced does not exist? Uh, nevertheless, that's part of my answer. Um, and the Jews, I mean, even some Jewish literature I've read said that what makes the world hate the Jews is their claim to be God's chosen people. Uh, again, that's more perhaps in the home in theology, but we have to. Um, Folk, we have to come up with some kind of a reason. And these things I'm telling you about, and it is a history class, and it's a, and this is a big part of history. You have to come up with some kind of reason for the hatred. And I've got, now if any of you have anything else you want to say about it, the floor is open, you're welcome. Um, I had heard all my life about Hitler killing the Jews, but when I was a, about 15, someone came to a church and showed a movie. This movie was not made by Hollywood. It was made by the Nazis, and it was completely on the bridge and let it human beings, the Jews, being starved to the point of emaciation, and they were nothing more than human skeletons. They could get up, walk a few steps. They were neither dead nor alive. It just when people are starved or beaten, they become a shadow of former self. They made the Germany, to give you some idea, American servicemen who saw the concentration camps and they were combat hardened and not moved easily, they broke down into tears when they saw the sheer horror of what happened. And they told the German people near living nearby, you must come and see this, and they would drag them out of the homes and through the camp. They showed pictures of German people having a big time laughing and kidding each other around, hey, what are we going to see? And they would all leave with their faces completely ashen, with their faces covered in tears. As they saw the sheer horrible destruction that had been going on right next to them that they were unaware of. I mean, there's a story told of a German officer who would always leave for work with a clean uniform. And he'd go to work and his job was to beat Jews with a whip. And he'd spend the day all day long taking a few breaks, just beating, beating, until his uniform was completely bloody. He'd leave his uniform behind, pick up a fresh uniform. The uniform would be longer overnight and come home in a fresh uniform and go to his wife and daughter who had no idea what he was doing until later. He wouldn't have yeah, he just he was working for the government. That's all he'd tell them. There's another horror story, a real horror story, about a certain German church that was located next to a railroad track. And every time they'd hear the train rumbling, 
They'd all burst into a loud song and play really loud music. The purpose was to drown out the screams that were coming from the people on the train, begging for help. So they, as the train got close to the music, it louder and louder and louder to completely shut out the screams. Then the train would move on and they, the, the singing would die down and they'd go back to their regular service, whatever they have to be doing. The whole idea was to shut out, even though they had some idea something was going on. All right. Now, what did the rest of the world respond to? I have to remember, in World War I, they had accused Germans of all kinds of atrocities the Germans had not committed. That was just part of the propaganda. So, in World War II, there were persons who escaped and went and tried to tell the British press, this is what is going on, and the British would ignore it. Persons did get to Mr. Roosevelt and tell Mr. Roosevelt, hey, they're doing this, and Roosevelt would, all right, I want to remind you something. Well, you hear bad news that after a while, all right, let me tell you, on a personal note, in the last 48 hours, I've read two pieces of bad news. One is that there might be a severe storm coming this way. What did I do about it? Have any of you heard a story of a severe storm heading your way before? Yeah. What did you do about it after a while? You want about my business? <laughs> if it comes, it comes. What can I do about it? I also heard that our economy might be on the verge of collapse. Yeah. Now, folk, I've heard that all my life. But it's, there's a certain rumor, sir, about the end. Our economy just might be on the verge of collapse. What do you do about it? Go about your business. I say that to say this. With people dying in a war and coming home maimed and crippled and somebody hearing, ah, there's a rumor going around that Hitler is gassing a bunch of Jews, burning them alive in ovens. Well, okay, then you go about your business and forget about it. Essentially, that's what happens during the war. Until, like I can say, a bunch of American servicemen bumped into a concentration camp and saw the horrors. Even Eisenhower appeared to be moved, his face white, action. Some of the other generals would just break down. I mean, these were hardened combat generals would just break down in tears when they saw this, the horror of it. One German mayor was told him, you and your wife, you come and look at it. And they came to a camp nearby. The next morning, they found the German mayor and his wife. They hung themselves. They had no idea what was going on just, just out of sight of their town. All right, so much for the Holocaust for now, the death camps. Again, um, you can't say enough about the horror of it. Now, there was another Holocaust, and one of you happened to write about it. A Holocaust that went on on the opposite side of the world, and among the Japanese. Um, the Japanese would go to places like Korea and China and take their people and use them as human experiments and the pain and suffering inflicted on these people would be just horrible to be described. The Japanese took a bunch of foreigners and moved them into Japan as slaves only. The Japanese do not like foreigners moving in. They take them as slaves and force them to uh, work in their factories, making war materials because the Japanese ran out of laborers. And oftentimes these people did not survive the sheer horror of the um, slave camps. The difference between the Germans and the Japanese, and again, one of you who at the paper has talked about this, Germany later apologized and began to make amends to the people they hurt. Germany gave foreign aid to Israel and has taken Israel's side and voted for Israel in the United Nations. As for Japan, they have never admitted they did anything wrong, and your book is going to wind up saying, even to this day, Japanese textbooks do not talk about forcing Korean women to work for them as sex slaves, do not talk about the exp human experiments where they killed thousands upon thousands of Chinese and Filipinos and Koreans. They don't mention it, and they have made no attempt at apology and they act like, hey, you know, uh, we didn't do anything wrong. Or these stories are exaggerated or grossly overstated. When we have all kinds of proof that, yes, you Japanese, you did it, what's the deal? All right. <clears throat> the book goes on to talk about how the South Asian people liked or disliked the Japanese. Um, they actually, they resented them 
and worked against them and wound up helping the Filipinos, particularly helped the United States drive out the Japanese. And it goes through the uh, nations, particularly the Soviet Union, the United States, and Germany, and how each nation coped. <clears throat> As for the Soviet Union, they uh, suffered more than any other country, lost more than anybody else combined. And folk, I have read at least one book who indicates that the Germans might have used an atomic weapon against the Soviets, but they ran out of weapons and they wouldn't use them against Americans or British because they wanted to get the British and Americans on their side to fight the Russians. And uh, that was part of Hitler's goal and Hitler's dream. So they wouldn't use them against the Americans. But as for the Russians, the Russians are known to have lost a lot of people. And uh, they would not allow foreign reporters to come in and see where the Germans had done the damage. So uh, the only thing we know is what Stalin and the, the Soviet press told to tell us. But we do know they lost a lot of people. <laughs> now, I have not seen this in print, but my teachers used to tell us, tell me when I was in school, that because the ratio of men to women was something like three women to two men, that the Russian government were pay, was paying women to have babies, whether they were married or not, and the Russian uh, women began to somewhat double up on some of the men, owing to the fact they had to, that so many of the women were left out having lost their husbands in the war. Um, be that as it may, that's no longer true now, but uh, it was supposedly true at the time. Uh, in the United States, Every factory practically was a war factory. The United States did not make automobiles for its own people, so the people in the United States had to keep their cars together any way they could, and they would use chicken wire and tape, and to keep their tires on the cars, they'd take an old, old tire and cut it up and put it inside another tire, and they used dinner tube. You know, have any of you ever seen that done? Put a tire inside another tire, and one tire inside another one, and. Uh, yeah, this was done a lot in the period we're talking about because they had to keep their cars running. That's why a lot of Model T Fords lasted 25 years. The Depression had come and there weren't very many cars being made. Then the war came and all the war factories were putting out war goods. It was not until 1946 that Americans began putting out cars again. Um, the 1946 models probably were slapped together really fast and uh, did not last very long. But that's something else. Oh yeah, Rosie the Riveter, famous girl in World War II, that she showed that she could handle rivet machines just like men, and uh, women were put to work in factories, which your book shows a picture of. Uh, only the Soviet Union put women in combat. But a lot of uh, the British and Americans put them to work in factories. And your factories were then being manned by old men who were too old for the service, or uh, women, mostly women, and old men. Um, the book goes on from there to talk about Germany, uh, how that in Germany, the people had met the war with indifference, unlike 1914 when they'd been eager for war, Hitler tried to keep their morale up by simply refusing to tell his people they must sacrifice. And here's, the, again, Hitler made a bunch of mistakes. And one of them was letting his people live as if there were no war on, telling them that they were not going to deprive you, you're not going to have to sacrifice. And the result was, I mean, hey, if you study economics, the government has two choices to spend money on guns. And what's the other one? Guns and butter. Taylor kept spending the money on butter like there was no war on, and eventually, I mean, you know, I'm speaking figuratively, and eventually, basically, he ran out of guns. And again, I may have told you this story. I mean, imagine, all right, for a minute, that you're a German soldier, and you have one bullet left, and there's a Jew beside you, and you see this American soldier coming at you, you have this Jew beside you, and again, I'm simplifying things, speak figuratively. What did the German soldier do? He killed the Jew beside him and faced the American soldier, who he knew if he was American, he had ammunition. I mean, any American soldier probably had ammo. He faced the American with an empty gun. 
this was literally, I mean figuratively, I'm speaking figuratively, about what they did. Um, Hitler tried to keep the morale of the German people up, but again, the Ger Germany wound up being bombed, um, which your book talks about, the bombing of uh, the bombing actually was started by the Germans. The bombing civilian, when the Germans bombed Poland, then they went over and bombed Britain. So the Allies took it up. Now your book tries to state that the bombings only made the other side more determined to win. And the bombings in those days were not accurate because they couldn't, for instance, the bomb was difficult for a bomber to hit a runway. Um, even though your book cannot deny what we already know, it was finally two bombs that brought World War II to an end. But before that, it was said that the German, the bombings did not slow down factory production. I've heard differently. Your book says that the Germans would, when a bombing alarm sounded, they would simply go hide in their bomb shelters until the bombing raid was over, come back out and resume work like they'd done before, go hide, and uh, you might wonder, what if the machine were damaged? They just simply all start working on another machine. Um, Again, the Germans and Japanese made a serious blunder in punching all their factories together in a lo small location. In the meantime, the Americans scattered their factories out. Hey, Lockheed is like the only war factory in this area. And also Lockheed, the big part of the factory has no windows, which meant that an airplane they come. Now today, they, they shine lights on it so that airplanes won't hit it. But it had no windows, which meant that the people could work inside and not be seen by the enemy outside. The German factories and Japanese factories had all these windows lined up in a neat line, and an airplane could be, oh yeah, they have a long, long, long row of windows. Hey, guess what? That's probably a factory on the other side of the windows. That's the moment. Um, All right, we'll pause right here. Now, I, I'm not quite finished with the chapter, but there's quite a bit I want to say at the end. Um, wait, I hope there's this much I must say. I got about a minute and a half. Friendship with a man like Stalin. When you are forced to be friends with a man, and sometime in your life you will have him already. It might be at work where you have a bad boss or a bad co the United States government and the British were forced to be friends with Stalin. Why, how did Stalin treat them? He was suspicious of them. He said, you're not doing enough. And then when the war was over, he stabbed them back by taking over the eastern third of Europe and helping the communists take over China. When you're friends with a man like Stalin, you're always under criticism. You never are good enough. You're always on the losing side. You're always on the defensive, always apologizing. And again, Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about what happened in the conferences when the war was over next time. I'll see.